fascistic system. 1,300 soldiers, there or thereabouts, uh, which seems to sound about right. Obviously, uh, civilian casualties considerably higher, particularly if you bear in, in, in view that in Mariupol alone, according to the uh, civilian authorities there, 1,500 people have been killed just in that city alone, uh, which is by by a long way not the biggest city uh, in, in Ukraine, although it has seen the heaviest bombardment. So, civilian casualties have all likely been much higher than the, than the military ones at this stage, but we're getting a sense now of what, what impact this is having uh, on Ukrainian armed forces. And at this stage, it has to be said that there's been plenty of reserves to keep this going. If their losses are just 1,500, high enough, it has to be said. But at this stage, they can take it Same again today, no progress really. They say that he's not ready at this stage to contemplate a ceasefire. Although, it has to be said, Vladimir Putin did say that he has seen some signs of progress in negotiations that the Russian side says are still going on between the Ukrainian and the Russian sides. Remember those negotiations started at that small town on the Belarusian Ukrainian border. Apparently, they're now continuing, but in video, there's some progress, but clearly not enough to. Persuade Vladimir Putin to stop the military operations. And, you know, I don't think that's going to work anywhere at this stage. The Ukrainians are saying, you know, if, if, if there's going to be, if there are going to be real negotiations, first of all, there has to be a ceasefire. Uh, President Zelensky has suggested a possible venue in Jerusalem, uh, but you know, there's no sign that the Israelis have done that yet, and certainly the Russians have. Okay, thank you very much for those updates. We'll pass the National Affairs Desk on the situation in Ukraine. Now, with millions of people fleeing the conflict there, EU representatives are trying to set up a so-called green corridor to allow refugees to leave through the middle of the and access other European nations. Moldova, Ukraine's southern neighbour, has been also blocked off from the EU border. Now, Moldova has been blocked off from the EU border. Moldova, Ukraine's southern neighbour, has already taken in 100,000 people, a significant number given its 2.5 million population. There is more of the situation at the Polish border. We've been speaking to Magdalena Zabodnik. Here's more from her. financial pressure to bring an end to the war, the United States and the European Union continue to distance themselves from Russia as they seek to squeeze its economy. This comes in the form of new sanctions on imports and exports, and they're also aiming to wean themselves off Russian fossil fuels. And the conflict in Ukraine could now even have repercussions beyond our own planet, as the head of Russia's space agency, Roscosmos, has warned that the International Space Station could come crashing down to Earth. This video, released by the Russian space agency Roscosmos, shows the Russian segment of the International Space Station detaching, leaving the station at the mercy of the Earth's gravitational pull. The 
head of Ross Cosmos says the West is risking this happening and says the IFS's orbit means it will improve on Russia, but somewhere else. Keep mind the 500 ton International Space Station crashed down on. The population of other countries, including those led by Gods of War, should think about the price of sanctions they initiated against Ross Cosmos. Is this an idle threat or a serious concern? Russia is responsible for keeping the ISS afloat, and it's true that if it fell to Earth, the food of it would go out of the atmosphere. But Russia's also responsible for boosting the ISS out of the way of space debris. If it stops cooperating, it could be putting the lives of three of its cosmonauts who are on board in danger. In any case, companies like Grumman and SpaceX are stepping in to make sure the ISS remains in orbit and movable. So the risk isn't a sudden plummet to Earth, but a sad loss of international scientific collaboration. It would be very difficult for us to be operating on our own. The ISS is an international partnership that was created as an international partnership with joint dependencies, which is what makes it such an amazing program. The ISS is scheduled for controlled decommission by 2031 when it will meet a watery grave in the Pacific Ocean. Well, that's all for this bulletin. There's more news coming up on France 24 in just a moment. music from a concert that took place in Paris this week in solidarity with Ukraine. One of the artists taking part was the renowned Franco-Georgian pianist Katia Bunia-Tishvili. Thank you for being here. It's a pleasure you. to have you. Now, Katia, what was it like to perform with so many different artists in this context? Uh, it feels somehow weird that there are kids and women and men in Ukraine mm -hmm. suffering in every day, uh, during every day and uh, you cannot do anything about it and you're doing a concert in purpose to somehow mobilize something or financially help or to spread a message that stop should the war should stop it's a necessity but at the same time there's a contrast in what you're feeling and being dressed being on stage but i guess the motivation of all these artists was there they were mentally and physically there to encouraged to do something for them and we wanted just to collect some money for people who are in need right now. Is that the best way do you think for an artist to protest at a time like this to perform? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that best way uh, for a human being uh, is to find a way to protest it somehow and with different professions, journalists do their thing, musicians do their thing, uh, but uh, at the end it uh, depends on human being what you want to say, what you have to do uh, what you want to do and how much can you do in this uh, situation. I think the message we had uh, um, during this evening was that we, it's not about choosing the sides, where is the bad side, where is the good side, it's more about we're against the war and it has to stop as soon as possible. Um, because it's 21st century and I think uh, diplomacy should be the way to negotiate things and if it doesn't happen it means that uh, there is no achievement, no progress in politics, and we're stuck in a history uh, which gave us a lesson that we shouldn't do war anymore, but somehow we didn't manage to make some progress and be simply human beings to have a dialogue, who have a dialogue and can find a solution without the war. You yourself have taken some action, though. You, you, you stopped filming in Russia in 2008. Um, tell us about your reasons for that. There was a war in Georgia in 2008, and um, despite my love for Russian culture and Russian people and this country and this language, my connection with this country, I decided not to perform there anymore. I refused every uh, um, 
every invitation because uh, as a human being, as a citizen of Georgia, first of all, but also as a human being, I wanted to protest the aggression. And um, at that time, I was not among many of the artists who did that because they didn't want to make uh, political statements. And I, of course, I understood them. But um, I thought that it was not a political statement. It was more about action against the aggression, you know, peaceful reaction against the aggression and uh, well the intuition that um, it might go farther and it's not only about the Georgian territory but it could also you know happen somewhere else in a, on a bigger territory as Ukraine is the fear and the intu intuition that it might happen one day was there uh, and unfortunately it happened uh, hoping that it will not happen anymore but it happened. so sometimes protest doesn't bring uh, much but m probably it's important to uh, not to you know not to forget about the consciousness of our acts as a human being as an artist but most importantly as a human being georgia and ukraine's efforts to have closer ties with the west have been something that's angered russia for a long time both countries are applying for eu membership do you think that's going to make tensions worse uh, well i hope that not but i guess it can uh, somehow bring not such a positive reactions from our big neighbor. Um, uh, but I think that we want Europe and uh, European countries in the Western civilization. I think that human rights are better protected. Um, the human beings can uh, be more free and creative in those countries. That's the reason why they want to be part of uh, this uh, civilization. Also, we are part of this civilization, because during the centuries we were part of this civilization, but it might have unpleasant consequences, apparently, yes. Katia, you were born in Georgia, the director of the fashion house Balenciaga, and Denna Gvasvalia was also born in Georgia. At the start of his show, Paris Fashion Week, he paid tribute to Ukrainians fleeing the country. Models walked down the catwalk through some fake snow, carrying big sacks with their possessions in them. He said on Instagram, the war in Ukraine has triggered the pain of a past trauma I have carried in me since 1993, when the same thing happened in my home country. When he was 12, he was one of 250,000 Georgians forced from their homes by Abkhazian separatists during Georgia's civil war, crossing the Caucasus Mountains with his family. Now, you were very young during that civil war, only six, I think. What memories do you have of that time? Uh, well, my parents protected us. They didn't want to show us what happens outside outside our apart apartment. Of course, we were living in a poverty, as most of the population at that time. Uh, and um, we were kids who had, uh, you know, not such a good conditions to live. Uh, that's it. But uh, they really tried to cover all the situation, what was happening in Georgia at that time, with art, with creativity, and not to give us time to think about what's going on outside. Also, we didn't have much connection with the outside world because mostly we're in the books and with music and uh, school and parents that was it they protected us as they uh, could with 100 percent but i think the traumas are always there for kids you cannot just take it away you can still smell the fear you can still smell, smell the of not knowing what's going to happen tomorrow you know this kind of not knowing and not being secure in your atmosphere children they feel it and that's the trauma also of today's kids in Ukraine I guess and it makes maybe a person more strong but at the same time you have some kind of pain in yourself that you always wear with yourself and you have the view on life with this pain I guess and I do not wish this for other children for new generations and I was hoping that the 21st century was century of information where we have access to all informations uh, which uh, sometimes brings some indifference as well unfortunately uh, because it's when you get too much information then you become also indifferent to certain things but I was hoping at least that it was a century of discussion of diplomacy of negotiation with words not with arms but um, we're disappointed all of us the cultural world has been affected. There have been many um, protests in the cultural world. The principal conductor and musical director of the Bolshoi Theatre in Moscow is stepping down. 
Tugan. Sokiev was appointed in 2014. Some Russian artists are being cancelled, such as the Boucher Ballet's residency at London's Royal Opera. Not everyone agrees with this reaction, though. Berlin-based star conductor Daniel Baramboum, um, whose grandparents were of Ukrainian descent, warned against condemning Russian culture uh, for President Putin's politics. Have <laughs> Russian culture is not the same as Russian politics. We must condemn politics loud and clear and distance ourselves from it unequivocally. But we must not allow a witch hunt against Russian people and culture. Katya, do you think that politics and culture can be separated in a conflict like this? Until the war is still here, no, because first objective, objective you about is that uh, what do we want? We want to stop the war, right? Right now they're shooting people, they're shooting children, women, men, and after when the war stops, after that, of course, I would never point on Russian musicians that we're pro, pro the war, pro war, or pro aggression, or pro propaganda. I wouldn't point, of course, and I think that. We shouldn't judge people. I don't like to judge people after the war. But during the war, what we should think about is how can we stop the war? You spoke a little bit about how art and culture helped you when you were um, younger and you fled your country. Let's take a listen to some of your music. And this is you playing a composition by the French composer and pianist Eric Satie. Uh, let's have a listen. music do you turn to in difficult moments of your life? I'm very different. I don't have one composer. Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms. <laughs> Not easy to choose. Rachmaninoff. Katya, thank you so much thank for you. joining us. We're going to play out with the Ukrainian national anthem that you performed last week with Paris's Chamber Music Orchestra. You're also going to be performing in Paris at the Philharmonie on the 20th 3rd and 24th of March. Remember our website, is on Twitter, and Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. Germany has one of the highest rates of domestic abuse killings in Europe, a situation that got worse during the Covid lockdown. Ich bin fassungslos, sprachlos, stehe noch völlig neben mir. Ich will und kann es nicht wahrhaben. Wie du so brutal sein? Du hättest mir fast mein Leben genommen. Media coverage of homicide in the country regularly sensationalizes and romanticizes the killings, while the courts are often lenient on perpetrators. Watch reporters Scientists, athletes, and artists.
race, the mother of all election, the presidential election. This is the time for the French to choose their president. We'll have all our special envoys on the campaign trail across the globe, the latest analysis, the best polls. Join us here on France 24. France 2022, the campaign on France 24 and France24.com. situation across the city is dire with food, water, heat in short supply. Nika Oyatade has more. The sun rises over Kyiv to the sound of explosions. It's another day of Russia's assault on Ukraine as its forces continue their slow and methodical advance on the capital. In the suburbs, fighting intensified, like here in Moshin. Satellite images showed multiple homes on fire. Russian shelling caused widespread damage here. Residents continue to pour out of the city, fearing their homes could be next. Speaking in an interview with France 24, the mayor of Kyiv said the Ukrainian army is putting up stiff resistance. Our soldier, Ukrainian soldiers, destroyed the plans of Russians. And uh, we are very proud to have a uh, very tough soldier who defend our houses. Elsewhere across Ukraine, several cities, including Shaniv and Nikolaev, are also under heavy bombardment. In the southeastern port city of Mariupol, Ukraine's foreign ministry say a mosque was targeted by Russian forces. 
The mosque of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent and his wife Roxolana in Mariupol was shelled by Russian invaders. More than 80 adults and children are hiding there from the shelling, including citizens of Turkey. Elsewhere in the city, the situation remains dire. For days, people haven't had access to the internet or electricity. They are running out of food and have to queue for water. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says Russia is to blame for the worsening humanitarian crisis. Mariupol, that is our side. Mariupol remains blocked by the enemy. Russian troops did not let our aid into the city and continue to torture our people. The number of evacuees from Ukraine fell Friday compared to previous days. Authorities say just over 7,000 people from four cities managed to flee. Well, for more analysis of the situation in Ukraine, I'm now joined by Jean-Paul Palomeras, former Supreme Commander of NATO Allied Forces. Mr. Palomeras, thanks very much for joining us today. Now, looking at the most recent developments when it comes to the Russian military movement, specifically the changes they've made, redeployments, etc., are we getting a clearer idea of Moscow's strategy? Well, I, I think we, we are getting a clearer idea now. Uh, obviously, uh, their aim, uh, they are taking the benefit of, of the mass, if I may say so. Uh, and so their aim is to fix, in a certain way, the Ukrainian forces where they are. So uh, the Ukrainians to defend the cities, uh, strategic uh, interest points like uh, power plants, etc., etc., they are, they are using themselves in a certain way. And uh, in addition, they cannot move to support another area where they are short of uh, supply if necessary. So uh, this is a, a long-term uh, effect uh, that the Russians want to provoke, and uh, hoping that uh, at the end, the Ukrainian forces will fall at the dominoes, as I say, and at once, which, which can happen. We don't know how long the Ukrainian forces will be able to resist uh, against this kind of uh, now, we heard that President Putin gave the green light to volunteers who had to go to the front, and we've also heard reports of foreign mercenaries getting involved in this war. Could you tell us a bit more about the international dimension of this conflict and what it means for the war? Well, we know that uh, Putin would use uh, absolutely every, every possibility, every tool, every people who is was eager to fight. You know, these people coming from Syria, from Chechnya, those are fighters. They don't know anything else than to fight. In so, uh, and they are brutal, for sure, and they don't care at all uh, for, the, for the Ukrainian, which could be different from the Russian. And do you see this as a sign that the Russian military uh, operation is weakened to the point where they can't conduct the operation alone? Well, uh, I think the, the question is about the conscripts. You know, there are a lot of conscripts in uh, the uh, Russian army. And so, uh, and Putin uh, uh, said that there was no conscripts. We have to prove that uh, some conscripts were uh, involved. And conscripts is a bit of a question because when they come back, uh, and when they are dead, then they come back to the, the corpse, come back to their family. Then suddenly the families discover that it is not a, a friendly peacekeeping operation, that it, it is war. Mr. Jean-Paul Palomares there, thank you very much commenting on the uh, military uh, dimension of developments in Ukraine. Well, for more updates from the war in Ukraine, I'm joined on set now by our international affairs editor, Rob Parsons. Hello, Rob. Now, we've seen, to make a shift from the military strategy to the situation on the ground now, we've seen some very uh, harrowing images on our screens of the consequences of the bombings. Now we're getting a clearer idea of the actual human toll in Ukraine with new statistics released. Well, there are new statistics in particular on military losses, because the, the Ukrainians have been issuing their figures on the Russian military losses. They're claiming somewhere in the region of 12,000 Russian soldiers killed. That's a figure that the Russians uh, are disputing. Uh, it's some time since they've issued.